here with Pueblo Mayor Nick Gratishar, and we're going to uh, talk uh, COVID today. We're going to talk a little bit about some issues facing the city. So thank you for coming on. Uh, this is a brand new world that we're in doing this so, live now, almost live. Almost live, yes. Yeah. Thanks Good for afternoon, John. It's a pleasure to be with you. Obviously, the, everything that's dominating the news right now is is Jared Polis, Governor Jared Polis has extended the stay-at-home order. So I wanted to ask you, how do you think Puebloans are doing monitoring this staying at home? And have you seen um, uh, Puebloans respond well to the new order? No, generally, I think they have responded well to the, to the new order. I mean, obviously, everybody wants to get back to work. Uh, everybody wants the stay-at-home order to be uh, over with. But... Um, I think people recognize that this is a serious threat that we're facing as a community and that we're going to get through it a lot quicker if we obey those orders, stay at home, and maintain that social distancing. Uh, this is a situation that's going to be with us for some time and we're going to have to reorder the way in which we interact with one another because we're going to be stuck with this virus until the vaccine is developed, I believe. On that note, uh, has the city put in place any plans since you've ex since the governor has extended uh, the stay at home order or is, is it just business as usual? How are you addressing the extension? Well, um, we're evaluating it uh, from the city's perspective. We sent when the order originally came out, we sent employees home that couldn't work from home, that they didn't have the cap capacity to telecommute but we're bringing them back slowly. Next week, we'll bring them back to work. Uh, we're gonna require city employees to wear masks when they're interacting with the public, when they're interacting with each other, because that will help stop the spread of, uh, of this virus. It probably doesn't protect the employee, but it protects others around that employee who might be asymptomatic, but be shredding that virus. So we're uh, probably gonna require that city employees have masks when they come to work and they're interacting with other people. Don't have to wear it if you're in a private office and you're not interacting with somebody. But those are the kind of things we're thinking about and talking about now that we'll probably implement next week. In terms of what you need as a, a city and as a mayor from our federal and state delegation, both in terms of addressing the healthcare crisis that we faced and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the economic situation. But in terms of the healthcare crisis, what are you asking the governor or our federal delegation to bring to Pueblo? You know, I think what we want to make sure of uh, is that if there is a crisis in Pueblo, that we have adequate uh, medical facilities and medical machines to take care of people. Fortunately, we've been pretty lucky in Pueblo. I mean, the number of cases last I looked was about 48. I haven't seen the numbers yet for today, but I think 48 cases, uh, three deaths, uh, that's obviously three too many. But what we're looking for, and I know that plans are underway. I mean, you know, I, uh, St. Mary Corwin's gonna be an auxiliary a medical facility to take care of some of this stuff. Army Corps of Engineers is in town. I think the convention center is being looked at for um, a less acute hospital facility if that's needed, if we have to clear people out of the hospital to make room for more seriously ill people, that's a facility that would be available for, for that purpose. So those are the kind of things we need. Obviously what everybody wants are tests, you know, and uh, adequate testing so that we can test as many people as possible. Because when we do that, and we're sort of able to eliminate people who don't have the illness, we can put them back to work. Uh, or if we had antibody tests, so would show that you already had the illness, you might not even know it, but uh, we know then that you're probably at much less risk to get that test, so you don't need to be as careful as someone who, who doesn't have those antibodies. But we're a little bit behind the curve on that, I think, and I think we need to hustle the production of those kind of things so that we can make determinations quickly so that we can... Uh, have sick people stay at home, not everybody stay at home. Have you had any word from the governor on when you can see more tests or is that still a fluid situation and you've- No, I, I think it's still a fluid situation. I've had some conversations this week with some private healthcare providers in Pueblo who uh, 
of their distributors are saying there are going to be some tests approved by the FDA, antibody tests that we'll be able to get in our office. If, uh, you know, you would like to make an agreement, you know, we could test some city employees and those kind of things. So I think these things are starting to roll out now, but um, not, not as quickly as I would like it because I don't think we're going to be able to loosen the restrictions or open up until we get some of that testing available so that, as I say, we can identify those people who are ill uh, and identify those people who have a very low likelihood of getting ill and say, okay, you're good to go. And we can focus not on just everybody being at home, but only those people that uh, are sick or that have been exposed to the sickness who uh, have a chance of getting it. On that note, how, let's fast forward to the end of April, early May. Um, how do you open a city up again um, in sort of this state where you don't know testing capacity and how do we get people back to work? And I know that you're anxious to get the economy started again, um, but how do you do this as an elected official and to guide Pueblo into whatever we're going to experience over the summer? Well, I think the testing becomes a big part of it because that's, it's not going to be like we're going to be able to flip a switch and things are going to be back to normal. I think the hard reality of this is, is that uh, we're going to be living in a different world until we develop a vaccine for this virus. I mean, and that, you know, I think we've got the best minds in the world working on it now, but they came to the party a little bit late. Uh, so we're sort of behind the eight ball. And that's going to be the key to it, I think, is, you know, really life getting back to normal is once we have a vaccine developed. In the interim, we need to get these other tests, these antibody tests and these rapid tests so you can tell right away whether somebody's sick. At the end of April, uh, early May, you know, it's, it's um, I don't think we'll have the bars and restaurants open by the uh, end of April uh, or early May. Um, you know, we had a meeting today with the health department. It's likely that the golf courses are going to reopen next week with some uh, different standards. You know, the governor's obviously encouraged people to participate in outdoor activities. So that's one we think we've got now where with these standards in place, there's a uh, small risk that the virus could be spread uh, as long as people adhere to the rules and the standards. So, you know, it's going to be a slow kind of process for, for us to get this economy going again. Moving to city finances, uh, I know that you're well aware that this is going to have a huge impact on the city. I think estimates are between 5 and 15% on city on municipal budgets across uh, the state. Um, 5 and 15% or 50? <laughs> are, are you expecting higher than, because well, the, baseline, the baseline was 2007 with those crashes and they, they, they said between 5% and 15%. So are you expecting higher than 15% drop? Oh, in sure. Revenue? Yeah. It's going to be a lot different than 2007. There's going to be a, a dramatic impact on our revenue. Uh, how, how big it is, we don't know yet. I mean, obviously we're a couple of months behind in terms of our sales tax returns, but uh, no, we expect that there'll be a, a large drop in revenue. One of the things we're hoping for is this in this new federal aid package that they'll have some revenue replacement programs for uh, cities uh, of our size so that it can help sort of replace that. We've got some reserves from TAVA reserves and you know if there was ever an instance where you should be able to use your TAVA reserves now is that time. I can't imagine a more dramatic uh, uh, need for reserves that, than this. So but no, it's going to be a, have a big impact. And we're preparing for that. And we're um, preparing our partners that uh, we've made commitments to for the rest of the year that, you know, you better apply for as much of these federal loan and grant programs as you can, because uh, probably this summer, the city's going to find itself in a situation where we're not able to honor those um, promises we made just because uh, we won't have the money. So I'm urging them to, and the letter's going out from me tomorrow to these uh, uh, agencies that get money from the city saying, hey, apply for this because you're going to need to replace that revenue that you're not going to get from the city. I spoke with uh, State Representative Danae Escar yesterday, and she said that they're making hard decisions as well. I, how how bad do you 
think this is going to be in terms of the hard decisions that you have to make, um, not by yourself, but with city council. Uh, yeah. Coming up. Well, they're going to be they're going to be hard decisions. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's going to be like nothing we've ever experienced in this community in my lifetime. I I think. Um, how how bad? I mean, is it? it do you? Because you said just a minute ago that that you guys have stabilized this a little bit, but I think one thing that people may not know is that the budgets are going to impact um, everything from police, fire, and and all those other commitments. Yeah. Are you expecting to see this impair not city services but hiring, um, expanding? Oh no! I, yeah, I think it'll affect hiring. I think uh, it'll affect some departments in the city more than others. I mean, obviously, our top priority is public safety, so I don't think you'll see the police department or the fire department uh, losing employees. But other departments, you know, uh, there might be some changes. But uh, it's too early to tell that now. We have, uh, during this initial part of the stay-at-home order really made every effort not to exacerbate the economic damage by, you know, shutting people off or terminating people or we paid them while they've been home, even if they haven't been doing work, just because uh, we, we wanted to try to maintain things. But um, with all the retail stores being closed and uh, lots of activities being curtailed, in a couple of months, we're gonna see a big decline in sales tax. Uh, which is the mother's milk of city government. Sixty uh, percent of our funds come from sales taxes. On on that end, um, I know it's early, um, and there has been the uh, Pueblo Economic Recovery Team trying to do uh, some things. But what can the city do to be prepared for when this, uh, when the economy starts to reopen in a staggered manner? Um, rather than, I mean, l l let's be honest, the situation we have now, we've had three years, and I know you've been elected under a wave of change. We had 40 years of a stagnant economy. Right. Pueblo's economy wasn't healthy compared to El Paso County. So in perspective of moving this forward, how do you get, the, get businesses and everybody ready so that we are not waiting until October or 2021 for our economy to return? Yeah, well, one of the things you're going to see is a recommendation from me to the city council and to the Pedco board of directors that we repurpose a portion of the half cent sales tax fund and make that available to local businesses that they could use to uh, sort of ramp up again, use it for inventory or to pay their rent or their mortgage so that when uh, businesses are ready to reopen, you know, they sort of have a jump start and they're obviously suffering just like the city's going to be suffering. but. Uh, and it's not enough to make everybody whole, but we're hoping that it will help fill those gaps in those federal aid programs for some businesses. And we thought that that's probably a good use of that money at this point is to make sure we preserve as many jobs as we can in the community uh, because we're not creating many right now just because of what's going on. I want to move briefly to the coming uh, May 5th vote for Black Hills and and we'll do this in an extended time uh, as we get closer to the vote. But, but right now there's been a little bit, uh, uh, some words traded on, 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 in the media and social and social media between uh, Lori Winner, Dennis Flores, city council members, and then, and then you, you're a proponent of moving to a municipal utility. They are opposed to it in the clearest possible way. Um, Cause this is a very complex issue. Why should Pueblo move to a municipal utility? Because it's going to be in the best financial interest of this community to do that in the long run. Uh, and the question that Puebloans have to decide is, do you want to be served by an investor-owned utility who's profit-driven and is not located in the city of Pueblo, or would you rather that utility be owned by a public entity who is located in the city of Pueblo? You know, uh, you know, John, that I served on the Public Board of Waterworks for 14 years. Um, that's the organization that would head up this utility department that would have water and electricity. The Board of Waterworks has done an exemplary job. We have the best municipal water supply in the state of Colorado and the lowest water prices on the front range. There's absolutely no reason why we can't do that with electricity. I spent the last two years 
you know, studying this effort as the community has, and I've become convinced, and I didn't start out saying we got to get rid of Black Hills or we need to bring somebody else in, but uh, I spent last year negotiating with Black Hills, trying to get them to agree to a rate redu reduction that would allow this franchise to continue for the next 10 years, and they were unwilling to do that. Uh, now, there certainly isn't any guarantee that if people vote for 2A, there will be an immediate rate reduction, but um, it's much more likely, much more likely that with the public power utility, our costs are gonna be lower in the long run in the future than if they're being served by an investor owned utility. There's a Winter Park, Florida went away and their power rates now are about 17% less or more than they were when uh, that investor owned utility had them. So, um, it just makes sense to have a public power utility. The public power utility won't pay state income tax or federal income tax, uh, doesn't have to worry about generating a profit for shareholders. All that money can be invested for the benefit of the ratepayers. And it's, we have the highest electric rates on the front range, and that's hurt us in our economic development efforts. We've got Pueblo businesses here that compare their power bills with businesses in Denver that do similar kinds of things. Ours are 40% higher. A Pueblo businessman who has a bingo burger here and a bingo burger in Colorado Springs, 49% higher in Pueblo for electricity than it is in Colorado Springs. Those are not numbers that can allow us to compete for new businesses. And we can turn that around in a heartbeat if we uh, have a public power system. Uh, we'd have local control. The voters would elect the people that set the rates. Right now, people have never gotten to vote for uh, the board of directors for Black Hill Energy, or have they ever gotten to vote for the board of directors of the Public Utilities Commission? Those are the two entities that set our rates now. We've got no control over that. Here, we would have a locally elected board that would set the rates. And if we don't like what they're doing, we can elect somebody else to do it differently. That's uh, sort of unheard of uh, in, this, in this day and age. But I think it, it gives the voters that, that total control that they're looking for. Um, are you optimistic that, that, that city residents are on your side or are they on, on, uh, on the other side? Real quick? Well, Black Hills has spent $700,000 trying to confuse people and trying to get them to think this is a risky proposition. Uh, you know, it's risky, riskier in this day and age to go to Walmart than it is to vote for 2A. I mean, you've taken more risk by going out and getting groceries than you would be if you're voting from 2A. But as I say, they're pummeling the airwaves with false ads. Their ads falsely claim that if you vote for 2A, your taxes are gonna go up. They claim falsely that the taxpayers have paid for the Black Hills energy system. They haven't. The taxpayers haven't paid anything. The taxpayers won't pay anything. It's going to be paid by the ratepayers, the people that use electricity. That's who, that's who has paid for the Black Hills energy system. Um, and we've probably paid for it not two times, probably four or five times over the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, we, we continue to pay for it because we're just renting it. We're renting it from them. Uh, they own it and they, you know, what happens to rent, it always goes up. It never goes down. I want to move finally to the last thing, and this is not political. Um, this is more optimistic. Um, you started Pueblo Shines uh, every uh, night at 8 p.m. And, and uh, the thing why it was surprising is in Pueblo, most people may not know from outside of the county, um, but, but there's never been a single unified elected official that's been able to sort of impart um, this yeah. sort of community spirit. What made you uh, do Pueblo Shines and, and, and wh what's your feeling that you, when you see so many <laughs> posts uh, holding well, up their phone online? I mean, I'm glad the community's gotten behind it. I just had a conversation with my chief of staff. And let me tell you, I wish that was my idea, but it wasn't my idea. I mean, my staff came to me and said, hey, Mayor, we think this would be a good idea. It's a little bit corny, but what do you think? And I said, no, I think that's a good idea. Let's do it. And we've done it, and the community has gotten behind it. And I go out every night at 8, and I've got two or three neighbors in uh, my neighborhood. And it's a pretty sparsely uh, inhabited neighborhood at this point. But they're out there shining their lights. And then you see the, post, the Facebook posts where people are doing that. We had a discussion now, and it was only designed to end with the original stay-at-home order that the governor entered. 
Um, and now that he's extended it till the 26th of April, they want to know what we're going to do after the 11th because it's only supposed to be 18 days. And I said, well, we can't have it be Buffalo Shines because it's going to be light at 8 <laughs> o'clock at night. So we have to figure out something else. So we're, we're working on that. But, uh, uh, you know, I think the community is really taken to it. And it, it just sort of gets across that message that, you know, we can be together even though we have to be apart right now. I mean, you know, we can pull together here. Pueblo's always pulled together as a community, and here we pull together as a community by staying apart, but this sort of says to everybody, hey, we're all in this together, and that's just one small thing for two minutes each night at eight o'clock that uh, sort of gives us a chance to uh, solidify and come together around that common theme. Well, I appreciate uh, you taking the time talking with us. I think that the, the Pueblo Shines is, has on social media has been something bigger than we've, we've never seen before, but um, yeah. I appreciate you taking the time talking with us and uh, guiding us through um, um, this very weird and strange time that we're going through right now. So uh, stay safe. I appreciate you, right. you joining us and um, we'll have you back on to discuss the utility more in depth when we have time. Let's do it. I'm ready anytime you are, John. Thanks All for right. having me. Appreciate, All right. Appreciate it. Thank Be you. safe.